For us, just take a moment and call on the name of the Lord. I know there's times we have of worship and praise, but let's just take a few minutes and call on Him. God good he loves us so much Amen. thank you worship team worship leaders and musicians and and uh, I love the presence of God don't you before we get into what I have I just want to share a quick testimony uh, conference of Mauritius just wrapped up today and they had 13 baptized in the name of Jesus And 12 filled with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I will say every week we have, uh, my, my parents have a chance to FaceTime with the kids and, and see them and everything. And she texted us saying, hey, we're, we're going to be late. I'm sorry, but we're still baptizing people, so we can't leave. Amen. I'm excited when we might have to cancel our lunch plans or delay because we're still baptizing people. Amen? Amen. I promise I won't be long today, and you can be seated. Um, the guy that's laid in my heart won't, won't take long to say I have one point, so I don't have like five, a list of five, you know, the five things or anything like that. I have one point. Um, do you know what a gift is? A gift is something that is given freely, no strings attached. Anybody ever received a gift? And how many are thankful for the gift of the Holy Ghost? Amen. Right, amen. The thing about gifts is that you also don't get to pick what you get. You get what you get, and you don't get upset. To quote an old children's book. Amen. Um, today I want to talk about the gifts of the Spirit. Now see, the validity of a gift doesn't actually uh, rest in examination of the life of the person who's acting in that role. See, a gift is something that's given, and it doesn't, a gift is something that we don't have to be worthy of receiving, because it's a gift. It's just something that's given to us. Uh, so let's, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to read, starting with verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same spirit. There are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Let's keep it down to verse 11. We're going to come back to verses 8 through 10, but let's keep it down for now for verse 11. But all these worketh that one in the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we are all are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. And skipping down to verse twenty seven, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. How many of you are grateful to be in the body of Christ? Amen. To, to have received the Holy Ghost and be born into this. See, the granting of gift, spiritual gifts is something that is a result of membership in the body of Christ. In other words, you can say it this way, it is your spiritual gifts that give you your place in the body. That's what 
Paul is talking about in First Corinthians 12. You can say this other way, another, yet another way. Everyone is given at least one spiritual gift. To him or her, to give him or her, him or her a place and a function in the, within the body. The other thing about the gifts of the Spirit is as you practically begin to operate in them, you realize that practically speaking, they often work together. So it's not like usually you only have one and that's all you get. Usually they, they start operating in concert, working together to profit the body. And that's what he's saying in, in verse 7, manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. What that means is it's given to an individual to profit the body. See, it's not for our glory. It's not for us to do anything. It's not for my benefit. It's for the benefit of the body. So make sure we're all on the same page. We're going to go back to the actual gifts in, in verses 8 through 10. So starting in verse 8. For one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now, the word of wisdom, to be clear, it's not the gift of wisdom. It's the word of wisdom. See, anybody can ask for wisdom and receive it. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the word of wisdom. It's simply this, a small portion of God's wisdom as it applies to a specific circumstance. To another, the word of knowledge by the same Spirit. Just like wisdom is not the gift of knowledge. See, anyone can go to school and pursue knowledge and research and, and gain just sheer information. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about information you would have no way of knowing. Something you have no personal way of actually ever having received it except God gave you an impartation through the Spirit. And to another faith, to another faith by the same Spirit, the gift of faith. So there are three kinds of faith that are mentioned in the Bible. There's a faith that comes from the hearing of the Word of God. The faith is part of the fruit of the Spirit that is a result of walking with God and you know what he can do because he's done it before and you trust him because you've walked with him and you know. And then there's the gift of faith that is imparted as a gift of the Spirit. See, it's a sudden assurance the Holy Ghost is, is that the Lord is going to do a thing. I was talking with my dad last week and he reminded me of a message that he heard Billy Cole preach and before the service even started, he got up and said, this many people are going to receive the Holy Ghost. He had a sudden assurance, the Lord told him, I don't know, 200 people, whatever, I don't know the number. Right before the service started, 200 people are going to receive the Holy Ghost. I would have to take a big leap of faith to say that out loud from the pulpit before the church service started. So let's say the number was 200. I don't know the exact number, but for the purpose of, of what happened. So after everything was over, the service was over, they counted up all the people that received the Holy Ghost, and there was 199. And they're like, well, count them again. And so they counted them again, 199. They counted them again, 199. And, and they're like, did you really hear from God? You're off by one. So Billy Cole said, you know what? Go outside, go down the hallway to the men's restroom, and look in the second stall. Sure enough, there's a boy there speaking in tongues, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, right? You know how many got the Holy Ghost that day? Assuming 200 was the note, 200. See, there's a sudden assurance of faith that can operate in the gift of the Spirit. The gift of healings is actually what the word says in Greek. It says gift of healing, but the word gifts of healings is the way it says in the Greek, implying different kinds of healings of infirmities or diseases. To another, the working of miracles. Well, healing's a miracle, right? How's that different? Think of it this way. Miracles outside the scope of healings. Like miracles of provision. Has God ever provided anything for you? Yeah? Maybe it doesn't involve the human body, but I would define it as something contrary to the laws of nature, completely impossible. To another, prophecy. The gift of prophecy. This is different than the ministry of the prophet discussed in Ephesians 4. See, a prophet will often operate with the gift of prophecy, but not everybody with the gift of prophecy is a prophet. It simply means speaking words out loud that the Holy Ghost tells you to say. To another, discerning of spirits. Discerning literally means to distinguish. See, it gives a, enables a person to recognize what spirits are at work in a given situation, whether it's the Holy Ghost, angels, demons, or even human spirits. 
to another diverse kinds of tongues. This is an ability to speak in tongues the speaker doesn't know. This is different than speaking in tongues when we get the Holy Ghost. It's where you have an unction of something to speak through you in tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. And this is simply the ability to interpret words previously spoken in the language unknown to the speaker and to whom the person is given, so the person that is interpreting. Tell you what, that, that to me, a lot of these make me uncomfortable. Right? Just to be honest, if God lays in my heart to interpret something, and I'm like, I don't know what they said, but I think this is, you know, it's, I just, that seems a little scary to me. i just say that. I would be honest. The key thing here, though, is that one key takeaway about all the gifts of the Spirit is that they aren't intended to, to draw attention to the person through whom the gifts are operating. They're used, to be used decently in order, right? So Paul was dealing with this in Corinthians, and he wrote three chapters about how to operate in the gifts of the Spirit in order. It's a lot. In 1 Corinthians 12, he lays it out that way, and then and it goes into 14, it kind of goes into more in depth about, about what to seek after and stuff. But some, sandwiched in between the two is what we always tend to quote at weddings. Love, suffer, charity, suffereth long. It goes on, basically saying that if we have the gifts of the Spirit, but we don't have love, then what good are they? So the gifts of the Spirit are operated for the profit of the body, and they are operated in love. I could say it that way. They are inseparable, one from the other. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 12. Even so ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Skipping down to verse 26, as he wraps up, starts wrapping up his, his three chapters on the gifts of the Spirit, he says in verse 26, How is it then? Brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath the revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. So the gifts of the Spirit are, are, are given by God to build up and edify the church, not to tear things down. Sometimes you do have to cut away things so that the right things can grow in its place, but that's for the purpose of building and edifying the church, the body. And I'm not talking about this four walls of this church. I'm talking about the church of the living God regardless of denomination or organization or, or whatever, the church of God. So, gifts of the Spirit. So, I want to, that was just to kind of get us all on the same page. What I want to talk about is being led by the Spirit. So, Romans chapter 8, I want to start in verse 12. It says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. Now mortify, that actually literally means put to death. See, that's a requirement on our part. If we want to live after the Spirit, we have to put our flesh to death. So, let's look at uh, verse 14 now. So, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. If ye have not received the spirit of bondage, again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. So I guess my question here is, what does it mean to be led? So, Landon, come up here. I'm going to pick on Landon. So if we're walking, come on up here. So if we're just walking in the same direction, right? The Bible talks about walking in the Spirit and being led by the Spirit, right? So come on over here. We're going to kind of walk together, all right? So if we're walking in the same direction, we're walking in the Spirit, we're walking together, and... We're kind of equal partners in this, although he has no choice to be up here. But we're kind of walking in the same direction. We're doing it together. It's fine. But now, so I'm going to ask you, come back over here. So I'm going to put my hand on your shoulder. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I don't have a choice in the matter. You pick. You walk wherever you want. I'll follow you. See, I'm going to follow wherever he's leading. I don't really have a choice. So if he decides to go down the steps, if he decides not to, if he decides to go, if he decides to back up or whatever, whatever he decides to do, I'm going to have to follow him, right? That's the difference between walking and being led. Thank you. See, leading implies a submission. See, there's an additional emphasis being led by the Spirit. There's an emphasis on his sovereignty and his leadership. 
We don't walk in the Spirit as his equal. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we do. We think ourselves like we're going to walk in the Spirit, but God, you're kind of leading me this way, but you know what? I'm going to kind of do my own thing, and we're, we're kind of in this together, right? Right? We we're, both have a 50-50 say in the matter. No, it doesn't work that way. See, being led implies a submission to the will of someone else. See, if we were to take the example, if we were a soldier in the army, then he's our commanding officer. If he gives us orders, what is the soldier supposed to do? Follow them and obey them. We have a strong example of leading in the Spirit happening in the early church. In Luke 12, Jesus himself instructed the 12 disciples to trust the Holy Ghost to give them the right words to say. In Acts 8, the Spirit told Philip to go to the Ethiopian's chariot. In Acts 10, the Spirit led Peter to preach to Cornelius' household in Acts 10. In Acts 13, the Spirit spoke up in a prayer meeting and commissioned Barnabas and Saul. In Acts 15, at the conclusion of the council in Jerusalem, they knew the final decision was the decision of the Holy Spirit. Paul's missionary trip was actually interrupted by the Spirit, telling them where not to go in Acts 16. And then a few verses later, he was led by the Spirit to Macedonia. See, every time the Spirit led, revival followed. In case you're wondering, being led by the Spirit is absolutely scriptural. And it says that being led by the Spirit, as many as are led by the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. See, the inverse is true. If you're a son of God, you should be led by the Spirit. Let me say that again. If you're a son of God, you should be led by the Spirit. See, we don't have to pray and beg God to lead us by a spirit. If you've received the Holy Ghost, you do not have to beg and plead, God, lead me by your spirit, please. He's already leading. So the question is, are you willing and are willing to obey? Do we have a willingness and an obedience to follow his leading? See, too often we want to be like Saul and disregard the instructions we're given and be like, look, see what I did? Didn't I do a good job? I did a good job with this thing that I didn't do the way you told me to do it. Isn't it awesome? 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22, and says, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. See, sacrifices throughout the history of Israel, it's kind of like, you know, we come to church, we love the opportunities we have to worship and praise God. And we love all of the things. It's kind of like sacrifice was like the thing you could do, right? And all throughout the history of Israel, that was like the pinnacle of what you could offer God. I mean, even going all the way back to the days of Cain and Abel, sacrifices were it. So the, take the best thing that you could do for God, obedience is still better. Obedience is better than the most awesome thing that you could ever think of doing for God. Too often we want to work for God, but we aren't willing to be led by the Spirit. So hearken, to hearken, better than the fat of rams. It's an odd word. We, we think of it as kind of like it hearkens back to something, like it kind of reminds us of something. But the word literally means to take heed. As one translation puts it, Submission. So my question, this is my one point I'm getting to. God has the gifts of the Spirit freely given that are part and parcel of being a child of God. And that, that is something that just comes with being part of the family of God. So I guess my question here is, have you felt the gifts of the Spirit operating in you? Have I felt them operating in me? See, I'm not saying this in the sense that this is something that God's been working me over the last few weeks. Have you been walking in the Spirit? Or have you entertained your flesh? Do you come to church not feeling like you belong? Sometimes we do. We come to church because it's the right thing to do, but we don't feel like it's our, we just feel uncomfortable and out of place. Do you feel like you have a place in the church, in the body of Christ. If we are being led by the Spirit and allowing the gifts to operate, see, 
How many of us have had that moment where God laid something on our heart to say to someone? God laid something on our heart, one of these gifts to operate through us. I know you've all felt it. If you've got the Holy Ghost, you've felt that at some point. And we're kind of like, eh, I'm comfortable where I'm at. I don't want to step out. Because what if getting up behind the pulpit and saying 200 people are going to get the Holy Ghost wasn't the voice of God? But the issue is if we're led by the Spirit, we're going to know the voice of God. We're going to know the difference between, eh, was it God? Or if God's speaking through me and operating through me, it's not about eyes on me. It all boils down to our mentality, our perspective, and what, how we are willing to be used by God. And so I'm going to ask that question again. If you haven't felt the gift of the Spirit operating through you, it's not because God isn't giving the gifts. It's because God's giving them, and we're saying, no thanks. See, I would love to, for us to actually have to have a series to say, okay, now, the gifts of the Spirit are operating. Let's sit down and talk about what it means to have the conversation in order. And I encourage everyone to read and study 1 Corinthians 12 through 14. But have we gotten to a place, I'm not talking about just this congregation, but as the body of Christ, have we gotten to the place where we don't even have to worry about the order of the spirits of the gifts and, and how they should be operating because we're not letting them operate at all? I know we've had the occasional moment. All right? We have tongues and interpretation. We have words of faith. We have healings, but they're occasional. God's wanting our church to move into a new aspect where the gifts of the Spirit are operating all the time, where we're following and walking and being led in the Spirit, where you're, you're just always being led by the Spirit. God's calling his body to that. You see, I feel an urgency. The Lord is coming back soon. And I'm looking forward to that day. But he wants his church to be built up. He wants his church to reach the lost. And all those tools come together to enable the body of Christ to build us up, to work as a body. As a body. So I'm just going to ask a simple question. And, and some of us, I know, are just all in different points in our walk with God. So some of us are obviously more in tune to lead, the leading of the Lord. But I ask you, if you have that moment come to your mind where you kind of shut down what God was trying to do? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Paul is giving a few rapid fire moments of nuggets of wisdom. He says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. See, Paul's using the same expression here as Isaiah the prophet used, to not grieve the Holy Spirit. And that context was talking about the people of Israel getting ready to step into the promised land. And they rebelled against what God was trying to do. After all of his deliverance and long-suffering, and all of his patience, they're like, eh, God, you can't do that. And it grieved them. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 13 says, quench not the spirit. And that's another rapid-fire moment where he's given a, a bunch of a bullet point list of all the things to do for the church in Thessalonians. It's been said over and over again from this pulpit and other pulpits recently, God is about to lead his church, not our church, his church, into a revival and returning to him with backsliders and new believers alike and a great outpouring of his spirit. We're at the same point in our story as Israel was. Don't choose now to disregard what God is calling his church to. Let yourself be led by the Spirit and allow the gifts of the Spirit to operate. We have faith in what God is going to do for our church. Am I right? Do we have faith for what God is doing in our church right now? It's easy to say, I believe God's going to do something. I believe we're going to have revival. It's harder to say, I believe we're having revival. I believe we are in the Spirit. So, I'm going to ask us to do one more, one thing here. If you've felt like you've ever done that and shut down what the Holy Ghost is wanting to do, I'm going to ask us to, you can stand, you can sit in your seat, you can come to the altar, but we need to repent for the times that we've quenched the Spirit.
that we shut down what God is trying to do through us. So, like I said, wherever you want to stand, sit, or come to this altar, let's repent for the times that God is asking us to step out, to say something, to do something.